At the time the shots were fired, did you look at the book depository building? No. Uh, did you think at that time that the shots came from the book depository building? No, I thought it came from a fence uh, between the book depository and the railroad track. Uh, does anyone else who you know or who you've spoken with also believe that the shots came from there? Most everyone thought it came from the fence behind the book depository. Did you have occasion to speak with Forrest Sorrells, who was, of course, a friend of yours, and the Secret Service agent in charge of Dallas that day? Yes, I did. Did he tell you where he thought the shots came from? He, he thought they were came, coming from the same place. Which is? Behind the fence. At the present time, where do you believe the shots came from? Well, they came from the book depository because there's proof that it did come from there. I see. This you've read in newspapers and you've read the report. Yes. Oh, well, there you go. Well, there you go. <laughs> that was easy. Orville Nix solved the assassination. Yeah, I mean, but, but everybody and their mother said it came from there, but no, right. obviously well, I believe it's just your explore. eyes. I read it in the paper. I was there, but I, now I believe the <laughs> Dallas Morning News. What a great little clip, Eric. You know, with him. that's Mark Lane, by the way, who went out in 1964 filming uh, uh, all the witnesses on his own dime. It's good that somebody did, and it's out yeah, there. Yeah, no, he jumped on that, and of course, he tried to become the lawyer for the Oswald estate, and Earl Warren said, nah, there's too, as as we learned the other day, the, the FBI said, nah, there's too many top secret documents. We can't have a lawyer involved here. That's ridiculous. I mean, a defense yeah. lawyer, a defense lawyer. Well, don't worry, though. We did see a lawyer, though, ourselves, live, who said, um, just everybody, go ahead and write Joe Biden, and well, he cool. gave us a phone number yeah. and the address. So Joe, yeah. Joe is standing by waiting for your call, Mark. Right. This is to release the documents December 13th, which were kicked down the road um, by Joe Biden in February. And we're also and Trump way, before Trump that. Too. No, I was going to say, I mean, they, they came mm -hmm. to him and they pressured him about X amount of documents, although Trump released a, a tranche. Um, the remaining thing is now on Biden's doorstep. December 13th is the day of. Uh, legally and we'll see what happens but this liberal lawyer uh who was at the conference uh gave a speech of course immediately denouncing trump he couldn't help himself and then went into a softer tone about joe biden and how he's going to do the right thing <laughs> we'll see about that there is no way my friend no, not as long as some people are alive. They're just going to keep trickling it out. One right. of the people at the conference had a, like a laundry list of of documents that are out there, like this person, 3,000 pages, this person, 400 pages. And I'm supposed to get emailed that list, but I, I look forward to getting that. We'll definitely put that up on locals of, you know, who's out there still, how many pages are, oh, yeah. you know, are tied to them, because I think that's just really, really interesting information. Yeah, at some, at some point, Hunley and I had to split up to cover more ground. We didn't yes. have a tracking device between us because there were different <laughs> things going on. So Hunley went one way, I went the other way, and then I had to take some naps because it was getting too long, and then we had to come back because it started early in the morning. It went into the night, and then we had to go to other – we went to other conferences to other, interview mm -hmm. other people. So you people are getting your money's worth. I'll tell you that. Yeah, much. actually, uh, Philip Nelson we interviewed at the other conference, right. and – a lot of it was on today's subject. Mac Wallace right. will be releasing that on Locals, uh, Locals exclusive soon. Mm -hmm. um, I did put up the Cyril Wecht interview that I did exclusive to Locals. It's up there right now if anybody wants to check that out. Mm -hmm. It's um, for you know paid supporters and Locals. We appreciate it. What? Uh, one last thing. Normally, I put unstructured.locals.com, and that is where you guys should consider going. And just for Mark, if I can find it. Oh, is the thing going to go across the bottom? Mark Great gets day, excited. Mark. I love this thing. Mark, I, Mark I gets excited. Like CNN or something. I don't my mind. We got the cry on. <laughs> yeah, it makes news. look like we're on TV or something. I really like the crawl. But uh, I went ahead and put up my Twitter handle, which is actually my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, whatever handle. And Mark has that up. I think it's good to put these up in solidarity 
that we all of a sudden are seeing actual people getting put back on Twitter. Oh yeah. Who were booted off for bullshit reasons. And it looks like maybe some good conversations are going to start happening there. Mm -hmm. And I always do post the links to the show typically uh, hours before. And then within a half an hour of the show going live, I post again, if you're interested because YouTube notifications are terrible mm -hmm. about this. And occasionally Mark will retweet it too. I, I will, right? <laughs> no, <I thought> yeah. <laughs> If he knows that he, he's busy, he's busy I'm, fighting I'm people. Such a Luddite. I, I could barely function in any kind of uh, social media space, but Eric's taught me a lot. Eric teaches me like I'm a child. And he goes, okay, <laughs> now here's how you do this. Now push this button. And I go, okay. Like he shows me how to do the audio and everything else because I'm an idiot. Well, we we um, did cover a lot of ground. I mean, those little miniature cameras, we got the Max Good interview. We got mm -hmm. the Rob Morrow interview. Uh, obviously, uh, Nelson, and then the unbelievable interview with Jim Eugenio, which was 95 minutes, Eric. Yeah, and we had um, another interview to a couple other people who are not as well known, but interesting. Oh, blow, One guy blow. who's a all blow uh, from uh, uh, Montreal. Yeah. yeah, Paul, and he went into um, that uh, something for Cuba committee. So, fair play for Cuba. Fair, fair play. Specialty. Like I've said before to Eric and the audience. The, the top people in the research community focus on one thing, and that's what they're known for. So this guy I wanted to interview for a while, he's from Canada, but his specialty is the fair play for Cuba committee that Oswald uh, was involved with down in New Orleans. But it was also a national uh, uh, movement uh, called Fair Play for Cuba. But So we interviewed him. And we interviewed a tippet expert. Oh, the, I forgot the guy who... But all these people knew us. It was kind of fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, this yeah. guy comes up and he says, he says, I got a bone to pick with you about Tim. And I go, what is it? He goes, ah, never mind. It was a tiny little thing. And he, you know, he started out with like some big, I go, what did I make, get wrong, bro? And he then backed up. He said nothing. It's some minor thing. He couldn't even remember. But he, Oh, Bennett Barrett. Yeah, it was a, some some word name that I pronounced Bennett or Barrett. And he, he couldn't let it go because he obviously lives on Spectrum Road. And um, a lot of these people live on Spectrum Road. So um, good guy, guy, though. I mean, that's actually the guy I was talking about who had the list of X documents here, X documents right, there, X right. documents there. I mean, right. so many people. All, all of these will be exclusive on locals. We may we'll pull it. pieces of them for shows here on YouTube, but full interviews will be on locals in parts or in whole. Like the Jim D. Eugenio. It's probably going to be multi parts. That was over ninety minutes. Of yeah, we went guy. we went down some rabbit holes, Jim and I. I don't know if Eric was following it, but we went off on some crazy tangents. Uh, he is the guy who just wrote with Oliver Stone, uh, "Destiny Betrayed," the four hour documentary that I strongly recommend everybody watch over the Thanksgiving weekend. If you want to see it on Amazon, I think they're two ninety nine per segment on Amazon uh, Video. And uh, also Apple, you can buy it for two. Yeah, it, it's all around. I mean, I, I yeah. bought the DVD because I wanted the audio uh, uh, director's cut um, with him and Jim. And Jim, Jim and I, this one yeah, right. that's okay. So uh, the Showtime cut is two hours called JFK Revisited. There's a companion book written by uh, um, Jim DiEugenio, a great book. And it's kind of the transcript of the show itself. And um, which, but it's well worth it because you can follow along. He's got to divide it up by different people and who they are in the documentary. I like the Wecht interview. Ohio Thank you, Ohio Pat. Thank you. Thank you. So I recommend the Destiny Betrayed. Uh, Jim D. Eugenio was just telling us stories about how it got made that were very humorous. Um, oh, and he also told us parts that did not make it in. Oh, yeah, that are, that are, oh, somewhere. Well, Oliver has them. Yeah, maybe we could find yeah. out later if Oliver right. will give them up to me. You know, Ooh, uh, that would be, yeah, mm -hmm. we'll he'll cough him up. But we had Jim and I have known each other for years, and but I've never met him. It's kind of like Hunley, uh, the same thing. I never physically met, and now he, I, he used to live in San Diego, but now he lives in Burbank, so he's a lot closer. Um, anyway, he's a he is the number one man, in my humble opinion, in the JFK research community, is Jim D. Eugenio. He's got a website called Kennedy and King. There's me and Eric. 
look, obviously I'm on meth or something there. Where is that from? Oh, at the airport. The airport. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're just so thrilled to. Uh, I had to the live there like terminal because I went with Eric at nine o'clock in the morning. My flight was at five o'clock. So I lived in the terminal for the entire day, um, which was sketchy at best. But I got home last night. Thank God. Oh, here's another shot of us. Oh, where is that? That was in the bar. I had to redo the, the lighting because it was this crazy purple lighting background. Um, so I ran it through a color filter, but what a what a crazy um, place. Dude, we had some interesting food, I'll tell you that. We went to the Rodeo Goat Bar uh, yeah. where I had a nanny goat burger. I don't know what Hunley had, but... Some dude's name. Some Oh, you had the guy's name. Yeah, like the Mac Wallace burger or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. some dude's name burger, right. Yeah, that was weird. And they were throwing um, ring toss onto goat horns to win prizes on the in the back of the bar. I don't know what was going on there, but the adventure was well worth it because we got so much interviews with real people. I was concerned that we weren't going to be able to corner these people, but apparently they all knew us, so they're all. Yeah, watching. it was kind of you know, cool. Yeah, it was pretty cool. We were surprised, you know, the Tippett guy and <laughs> and obviously Rob Morrow who's an expert on LBJ and Philip K. Nelson. D. Eugenio even saw um, our first Ruth Payne episode. Right, right. And we, we interviewed Max Good again to catch up on what has happened. And apparently Ruth Payne has, has, watched, seen it. has watched his documentary and made some startling comments about the documentary that are good <laughs> and bad. Um, she has thoughts. She has some thoughts. And she... <laughs> is coming to the 60th anniversary next year and god willing so will eric and i and maybe we can catch that woman uh to do an interview that'd be with her and max good <laughs> oh, no, it's good that would, be, that would be the greatest day of my life oh god Holy cow speaking of that there's soon coming out some footage about ruth Payne that oh, i'm yeah. putting together with the behavior panel okay to see yeah how how does she do with body language does she come across as um reliable hmm. so, and be interesting up on his patreon page um you said max yes he I, has I, a full his, interview. His, outtakes, his outtakes are on his patreon thing uh which i guess you could find under max good um oh somebody's saying that uh it's streaming on canopy and i think that's a free service or one with i have kind of i use canopy all the time it's a uh, west coast library service with hundreds and thousands of international films um that's okay. cool it's good to know it's out of san francisco but the well, so is max <laughs> right that's why, <laughs> probably why it's in there and so is everybody else is from california apparently too oh, um, okay susan's on the case uh i want to meet sarah well you're gonna have to go to pittsburgh for that one susan well making reservations now for next year i, well, I don't yeah, know go, go to pittsburgh that's where he's going to be for the 60th uh, in his own backyard i think um Anyway, so I, today, as you know, is what, Eric? 59th anniversary. Or fifty. I don't even know what you call it. We're not celebrating it, but we're commemorating right. it. Commemorate. But it is, it's my nephew's birthday. So happy birthday to my nephew. Way to step on the uh, president's death. That's really All right. Cool. Well, happy birthday to your mother, too, there, buddy. My mother's birthday was November 21st. Oh, it's the first. Okay. Yeah, November 21st. And then we would celebrate the birthday, then get into this the next day. And I think my parents' anniversary was like the 25th. Everything happened like in one week with his family uh, around this date. Aldous Huckley, that's right, same day, died over here less than less than 3,000 feet from my door. Is uh, Huxley Terrace Apartments where he died uh, November 22nd, taking, I think, 5,000 micrograms of LSD. I'm not sure of the amount. I, it might be 10,000, um, as we learned from a... Uh, a guy named jolly west who killed <laughs> Let's Go the elephant um and maybe jack ruby right and lsd can kill you in massive overdoses and he had terminal cancer anyway aldous huxley so um he just chose the wrong day to exit the planet because it ended up on page 17 somewhere buried in the new york times um, it's like like the other things that happened on nine. Don't quote me on. I, I just want to say something. I don't know if it's on page seventeen. You, if you're from New York, you talk in generic terms of, of stories. Hey, it wasn't on seventeen, bro. It was on sixteen. I'm, I'm just saying it was buried. Uh, that's right. Yeah, oh wow, that's another good one. Wow, as much press as it might. Okay, wow, everybody's dying that same day. That's weird. Oh, oh. Anyway, so I wanted to read the opening of this poem right before to commemorate the twenty second, Eric. And okay. Um, it's a poem called, not a poem, but 
it's uh, a piece called Murder Most Foul that came out last year, and it's all about the assassination. So I just thought I'd read. It's really long, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to read the first few paragraphs and uh, to commemorate today being the 22nd. So just bear with me here. Twas a dark day in Dallas, November 63, the day that will live on in infamy. President Kennedy was riding high, a good day to be living and a good day to die, being led to the slaughter like a sacrificial lamb. Say, wait a minute, boys, do you know who I am? Of course we do. We know who you are. Then they blew off his head when he was still in the car, shot down like a dog in broad daylight. Twas a matter of timing and the timing was right. You got unpaid debts and where you've come to collect. We're going to kill you with hatred and without any respect. We'll mock you and shock you. We'll grin in your face. We've already got someone here to take your place. The day they blew out the brains of the king, thousands were watching. No one saw a thing. It happened so quickly, so quick by surprise, right there in front of everyone's eyes. Greatest magic trick ever under the sun. Perfectly executed, skillfully done. Wolfman, oh, Wolfman, oh, Wolfman, howl, rub-a-dub-dub, it's murder most foul. And this goes on for about 20 minutes. It's um, Murder Most Foul by Bob Dylan, uh, probably his last masterpiece. It came out about a year and a half ago. And in there, he touches on every single pop culture reference around the assassination because that night, Wolfman Jack, who was on Dr. Brinkley's radio station down in Texas on the border. Oh, my. <laughs> oh yes, my friend. Bringing it together here. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I wanted to do. That was blasting out all of these pop culture music icons all night live. And you could pick it up even in the Soviet Union. And, and Wolfman Jack, that day and night, just kept playing all the greatest hits of American pop culture, which are referenced in Murder Most Foul, obviously by Bob Dylan, uh, who was listening to it that night in in, in Hibbing, Minnesota. Um, and he describes every single thing in American culture. It's kind of like a Bob Zimmerman. Yes, 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 it's the poet Robert Zimmerman. Anyway, <laughs> and now on with the show. I just wanted to get into that a little bit. All right. So today we are talking about the illustrious, um, I don't know, sidekick, crony, um, hitman, Mac Wallace. Yeah, I mean, he's part of the mob of uh, LBJ, LBJ's crew. I don't even know what you call it. It's like a white collar mob that LBJ put together with Horace Busby and Cliff Carter and him. And, and, and you know, four or five other guys. Uh, Jack Valente obviously was part of it. And I mean, it's a crooked group of cronies, but at the end of the day, sometimes you had to physically enforce Billy Saul Estes was involved, Bobby Baker, obviously, you know, they're bag men and stuff, but sometimes you need an enforcer, Eric. And that's where this guy might've come into play. Now, it's a funny thing about Mac Wallace because for years, I just thought he was an enforcer, like a, a muscle guy, but he's not, he's not. He, there's much more to Mac Wallace than I ever knew. This is the, one of the most fascinating guys in the entire uh, uh, JFK assassination genre. Really, I, I mean, this guy's up there with David Ferry in terms of, yeah, here's a young shot of Mac Wallace. He, handsome guy. A, a, incredibly handsome guy. And I'm going to tell you why he's an incredibly handsome guy. He's like six feet tall, about 180. He's a, he's a star quarterback at Woodrow Wilson High School in Dallas. He's a ladies' man. He, he has everyone looking up to him. He comes from poverty, and there's a lot of wealth around. And he has a girlfriend um, named uh, Nora Ann Carroll. And remember this name, ladies, because Nora Ann Carroll is the love of his life and vice versa. And Nora Ann Carroll has to, doesn't have to, but she did marry a wealthy doctor to her own regret and lived and married this wealthy doctor. Uh, here's the two of them together. Um as a couple, this is, he was, you know, convinced, and so was she, that they should be married. And she wanted to marry him, and and her parents would, wouldn't let her. She had to marry this doctor. And I think it triggers Mac Wallace, who goes into uh, becoming an alcoholic and marrying someone else named Andre, uh, Andre Barton, who he will marry because it's simply time to get married. You know what I mean? So... Getting back to after he gets out of high school, in high school, this is really interesting. Mac Wallace 
is a leftist, borderline communist in this high school at Woodrow Wilson, then at UT. He goes to the University of Texas, where the dean of students is fired for being a socialist at the University of Texas, UT in Austin. And the guy is fired. And Mac Wallace organizes a student protest to have uh, Rainey, the, 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 the chancellor, restored. Um, and it's such a big deal that UT is put on academic probation for nine years by the American Collegiate Whatever Association. And Mac Wallace is, is a photo, maybe Eric has it, of him in the middle of a crowd of students, Eric, uh, with a large mob. Maybe you could see that. Is in, and if you look closely, you'll see Mac Wallace in the middle of this student demonstration. And a uh, tough break. <laughs> yeah, I'm not minding that one. Okay. okay. So we're off to a good start. But nevertheless, right. so Mac Wallace is involved in all these student activities. He becomes the student body president. He becomes every single thing you could possibly do in a school. And he does this in high school where he's a superstar athlete. And he does this uh, when he goes to college. And in between that, he, you know, becomes a Marine, as people will do. And he's put aboard a ship and on board the naval, I think it was the USS Lexington, but please don't, uh, uh, I'm not really sure about that. But he's put onto a ship, World War II, and he slides down the ladder. You know how you're supposed to slide down those ladders, Eric? You know, on, sure. a, on a, right. He slides down the ladder and lands on the deck, uh, breaking his back. Mm -hmm. So he's given a discharge from the Navy. And the reason the discharge in, is important and the importance of the Navy is that Mac Wallace then becomes a member of an organization called ONI, Office of Naval Intelligence. And they court him and he is now back in Texas. It, it, and it, it's he goes through all these different security clearances and every single person says, biggest patriot, greatest guy in the world, unbelievable. There's the shot, Eric. You find, there, there's Mac Wallace in the middle. Just to show you who this guy was in, in college. Uh, this is not a minor thug working for LBJ, which is what I thought for years. This guy is huge. He's huge. And they thought he was going to run for president of the United States at some point. And, and, and he gets involved with alcohol and he gets involved with other, other things. But he gets all these security clearances even though a guy named Horace Busby, who became one of LBJ's closest aides, was the only guy publicly to call him a complete communist, that he was lying, that he was one of these progressive communists who would just say he was liberal to get through security clearances, Eric. You know what I mean? <laughs> so there's, there's some sort of ambiguity as to whether Mac Wallace was just another liberal or was he a total communist? And and I right to this day, I'm not sure because they, he plays both sides of the street. Mac Wallace. Well, and, Roosevelt was accused of stealing the liberal term as a progressive. So. Right. And he votes for Wallace for president, by the way, no relation to him, who was an avowed communist uh, who, who uh, LBJ, want, LBJ, FDR wanted as vice president, but he couldn't have. And they gave him a guy named Truman instead of Wallace at the end. But uh, uh, he did. He was voting for Wallace, who was perceived to be a communist at the time. Um, anyway, so Mac Wallace, Malcolm Wallace, um, is in love with this Nora Ann Carroll, who is brilliant herself and becomes a biochemist. She goes to also to UT. And now he goes to New York and he goes to Columbia University to get. Uh, yeah, there's the two of them again. It, it's an amazing relationship that goes on and on and on for decades. Even though she marries this doctor, they don't do anything uh, that I know of that they would admit. But they're a great looking couple. So Malcolm Wallace goes to New York. He signs up for classes at Columbia to get his master's in economics. And he begins to teach at CCNY. He, he goes to the New School for Social Research, which is where I went in 1946. I didn't go in 1946. I went in 1976. But he also signs up for classes at the New School. Um, and 
by all imaginations, this guy's on a rocket to start America. I mean, there are claims about this, and it's in dispute, but I found it when I was looking. What? Of him with uh, H.W. in 1947. It's very likely. I mean, it, it's no big deal. I mean, he was friends with everybody. Everybody knew this guy. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, I mean, Columbia. So showing another dot. <laughs> right. Well, he doesn't graduate from Columbia, nor does he really get involved in the culture of Columbia. He drops out of Columbia without a degree, goes back to the University of Texas where he gets his master's. And he was trying to get his Ph.D. I don't think he got the Ph.D. But the point of the matter is he gets involved in, in, in LBJ. He's brought into the fold by Cliff Carter because they know who he is. So he's brought into the LBJ circle, Eric. And what LBJ does is he puts you in um, the, uh, uh, the farming division. What's it called? The Department uh, of Agriculture. Department of Agriculture. And apparently in the Department of Agriculture, LBJ hid a lot of his cronies. Now, in the Department of Agriculture, is also it was also being used in the 40s and 50s by the CIA. Why? Because they would go to these banana countries. republics. They would go to these banana republics <laughs> to teach them how to farm. And so this was a great cover for the CIA internationally. But LBJ used it just to stick his cronies on a payroll, figuring the whole the whole thing's corrupt. What difference does it make? The CIA is not going to tell me. So and he put people there and he was making about 700 a week um, back then, bought a car and he's doing pretty good. And he meets this girl, like I said to you, Andre Barton and Andre Barton, another stunning woman, uh, apparently has some problems. <laughs> so it kind of becomes like Sid and Nancy. So they fight. Okay. They're both drunk. It's like Barfly. On the eve of, of them getting married, she tells him she's a lesbian, right? Or bisexual. And she, he says, what? And she goes, yeah, I, I like going to the park. Um, I forget the name of the park. It, it's in Dallas or outside of Dallas. Zilker Park. Maybe. General Walker's Park? No. It's, no, it's a different <laughs> park. It's a different <laughs> park. Zilker Park, if anybody in Dallas knows this park where she would have oral sex with girls in the bushes. Now, I can't make this up because she said this. It's in her letters. So I'm sorry <laughs> to be so blunt, but this is... And then he would have sex with her there in the same park. I, I don't know what's going on in that park. But she was going to lesbian bars, claimed to be bisexual, and they fought tooth and nail, had a couple of kids. She files for divorce like, like three times and then rescinds it. He moves to like North Carolina where he's teaching at the University of North Carolina, because he's still considered uh, a man of high intellectual prowess. And he's teaching economics at, at, at UNC, and she shows up there. And uh, wherever he goes, she shows up and then goes back to live with a mother when she has another kid or needs to raise a kid or something. Very bizarre relationship between him and Andre. And the reason I mention this relationship with Andre, because we're now going to get into another relationship uh, with a woman named Josepha. Now, this is Josepha. Josepha was about five foot ten, stunning. And the photo doesn't really capture the beauty of Josepha Johnson. And she may have been five eleven for all I know. But Josepha Johnson was also an alcoholic. Also, um, uh, here she is with an unknown brother of hers named Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> this is her brother on the right, and that's Josepha Johnson on the left. I think that's her kid uh, from another marriage. Now, Josepha Johnson was married briefly, briefly, to a lieutenant colonel. You'll like this, Eric. This is not part of our story, but this is just a little tidbit that I know about. She was briefly married to a cat named Willard White. And you say, well, who is Willard White? He was Lieutenant Colonel Willard White from, from Texas, who at the end of World War II was able to secure in Hitler's headquarters all of Hitler's silverware and bedding and linen and towels and shirts and pillowcases and shipped oh. it back to the United States in a huge cargo plane filled with Hitler's crap that he took. And he got caught, Willard White. And he got in a lot of trouble. I think he was kicked out of the service, became a huge national scandal that Willard White had secured all of Hitler's stuff and sent it back to himself and was selling it like silver trays and, 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 and butter dishes and his bedding. This is who was married to Johnson's sister. 
Okay, just, just so you He's know. He's an import-export guy. He was an import-export guy. So she immediately divorces Willard White, which means she's now on the scene, Lucy Goosey, running around Austin and sometimes in Dallas. And she meets uh, this guy, Malcolm Wallace. So they begin to have an affair. Malcolm Wallace, who we're going to get into in a second. If you could show the picture I showed you of uh, John Douglas Kinzer in the military sure. outfit, because this is important. Okay, so uh, this guy, this is John Douglas Kinzer. He was a captain, I think, in the medic uh, unit. Um, and he came back and he enrolled in the University of Texas at the age of 33 to become an actor. He, he wanted to become an actor, and he was in the theater department uh, where he met Andre Barton, who was Malcolm Wallace's wife. She also wanted to become an actress, so she's in the theater department. They hook up, boom, 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 boom. Now they're doing something together. This guy and the wife, bisexual wife, uh, <laughs> Try to stick stick with those people. <laughs> There's a lot of players here. So Malcolm Wallace's wife is with this guy. Now, what does this guy do? He ha he runs a miniature golf course uh, in Austin called Pitch and Putt, which, according to Rob Morrow, is still there, which we learned the other day. So this guy runs this Pitch and Putt thing. And Lyndon Johnson, this is part of the scams that Lyndon Johnson did as a senator. He would have his men, Busby, Cliff Carter, and, and, and the others, scour the economic community in Dallas and Texas and Austin, finding small businessmen who needed government loans, Eric. This was one of his, just to get into details of how this worked, he would find people who needed loans, give them government loans, and then take a kickback on the loans. That was one of his many, many scams. People wondered, how did Johnson become a multimillionaire while being a senator and a congressman? This was one of the ways. Also defense contract uh, kickbacks, but he had a, a million scams going. And one of the guys who ran these scams was a cat named Billy Saul Estes. And there's a photo I sent you, maybe you have it, of, of Billy Saul Estes, because he's going to come into play here into this story, because Billy Saul Estes gets caught and he has to go to prison. And when he comes out of prison, he is not protected by the Johnson group. And he tells all uh, that he knows. He doesn't say when he goes to prison, he says it when he comes out. And um, there's Billy Stylistis. I think he's either going to court or prison at this point. And he was one of Johnson's bag men. And Johnson, uh, uh, one of his scams that's Billy Silestis right there. Yeah. One of his scams, again, in the agricultural department, they had these grain silos in Texas and the grain silos were filled up with grain by the federal government, right? For the, for the farmers, Billy Silestis and his men sold all the grain on the grain market. So the silos in Texas were empty and a cat came snooping around from the agriculture department. That cat was named Henry Marshall. And Henry Marshall was a straight shooter. Henry Marshall was an investigative uh, 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 government employ employer for the Department of Agriculture. And he found that those grain silos were empty. So Johnson said, just pay them off. Let's go. What do you, what do you, what's the big deal? Well, Henry Marshall would not take the money. And Henry Marshall had no dirt in his background. So in... in one day, when all of this happened, Johnson put his feet up on the desk and said, get rid of him. And that meant get rid of him. So what happens with Henry Marshall is they find him, they find him out on his own ranch, like 10 miles back on his own, on his own ranch, uh, dead from multiple gunshot wounds to the stomach. And the judge, who was a LBJ crony, declares it a suicide. <laughs> So the, the multiple gunshot with a rifle to the stomach becomes a Texas suicide of Henry Marshall. So uh, there was a guy named Clint Peoples who was a, a Texas Ranger and some other people who didn't buy this. So they had his body exhumed. If you can see that, that maybe there's a photo of them. Yeah, they went and dug up Henry Marshall and it found out that he had been uh, killed by a blunt force hit to the head 
and asphyxiated with carbon monoxide from his own truck and shot multiple times with a rifle in the stomach, but not by himself, but by somebody else. So that became the murder of Henry Marshall. And it could not get back to Lyndon Johnson. And Billy Solestis knew about this, went to prison over the Henry Marshall story. And people who did know that Johnson was linked to this just didn't say anything. So there was a guy, like getting back to Kinzer now, the golf pro. This guy, Doug uh, Kinzer, who ran the pit and putt uh, place in Austin, uh, there he is again, good looking guy, a lot of women. He's having sexual relations simultaneously with Josepha Johnson and Andre Barton Wallace, the wife, uh, on and off again, wife of Mac Wallace. So Mac Wallace hears about this and he's got a gun that's given to him after the war, a souvenir, a German handgun. Uh, Schmeiser or something. It's not a Luger. It's a thing called a Schmeiser. And it's a piece of shit gun, but the guy gives it to him anyway as a souvenir. Uh, and the guy was a guy named John Schott, I believe. S, ironically, Schott. Uh, S-C-H-O-T-T. -T. John Schott comes back from the war. He also knows Malcolm Wallace, and he wants to get rid of this gun. Uh, so he gives it to him as a gift. So he takes this gun, and he goes to the pitch and putt where he finds uh, uh, John Kinzer and he empties the entire gun, two shots into his scrotum, two in the heart, one to the head, another one to the stomach. And the guy's on the run. He's not dead because he's in great shape. And there's, a guy, there's people there who are renting golf clubs and shit. So <laughs> there's blood everywhere. He shoots him in the head as the final shot. He shoots him in the heart and he shoots him twice in the crotch to make sure, I guess, that, uh, I don't know, some sort of a statement. And then uh, there's, yeah, there's his uh, grave. That, that must be the date, October 22nd, 1951. Yep. So obviously um, John Kinzer did not make it. He didn't make it. <laughs> uh, by the time the ambulance was there, he was already dead. So these golfers are there and they see Wallace. And one guy writes down his license plate number. There's blood all over the uh, uh, the office because he's moving around and shooting him. He jumps into his station wagon. They write down his plate number. Uh, Malcolm Wallace flees. He puts the gun into the empty um, part of a tree, like a stump of a tree. It's never found. The gun was never recovered. He's got blood all over him. Um, and they write down the plate and they pick him up. The police get him pretty quickly. Here's the police sketch. Doesn't look anything like him. But that's the actual sketch by the golfers. And they got the plate number. And it's kind of an open and shut case. I mean, there's, there's really a no-brainer. Um, but Malcolm Wallace goes on the offensive. He is brought into jail. And the first thing he says is, go fuck yourself. I work for Lyndon Johnson and I got to go to D.C. I got to get out of here. And they go, what? He goes, yeah. Here he is being brought in by the sheriff. And... Already phone calls are being made from D.C., just like with the JFK assassination. These phone calls start coming in from Busby, Cliff Carter, LBJ, and, and his cronies to the sheriff here. And uh, he is put in communicado. He, they keep asking him questions. And he says, I'm not telling you anything. Give me a law. Get my brother the lawyer or whatever. He's well connected in the intellectual community in Austin. He knows everybody. So they lawyer him up. This guy shows up and uh, goes and gets a writ to get him out of jail on bail. And he quickly gets bailed out of jail. And I think this is a Marine shot, actually. This is um, when he joined the Marines, this one. Here. Oh, okay. Right, that's a little younger. Uh, but he lawyers up and he begins to put together an unusual defense. Uh, he doesn't plead guilty. He says, I didn't do it. He says, you have no evidence. <laughs> okay. They give him a paraffin test. Both hands test positive for gunpowder. I mean, this is insane. You couldn't have a more open and shut case. But this guy, he's not buckling. He calls up his friend, uh, Shot, who gave him the gun. And he says, I want you to find me an expert, uh, uh, Shot who can disprove the paraffin test. And he says, well, I, I don't know. A paraffin test is pretty definitive. 
are you the uh, uh, what what side of this case are you on? He says, well, I'm the defendant. And he goes, so Shot, who's his friend, says, I don't think we can help you. Now, what does Shot do for a living? He's an FBI agent. So he's calling up Quantico, Virginia. He's calling up Quantico to talk to his old friend, John Schott, to help find him an expert and testify from as an FBI agent on his behalf. So the guy said, Malcolm, we don't really do that. If we ever do testify, we're usually on the prosecution side. So, so Malcolm Wallace says, all right, go fuck yourself. So he writes a letter to Jay Edgar Hoover. And he says, dear Jay Edgar Hoover, I need your help. And he just writes this letter like Jay Edgar Hoover is his friend. <laughs> and uh, apparently because of Johnson, LBJ's relationship to Hoover, Malcolm Wallace feels, hey, I work for Johnson. This guy's friends with Johnson. In 1949, he went to a party when LBJ won the Senate in 1948. Uh, who shows up at the party? Jay Edgar Hoover. And so, I mean, he's at the party with Jay Edgar Hoover in 1949. Well, anyway... LBJ, uh, uh, Hoover writes him a letter back, kind of a form letter, you know, kind of the same thing uh, that Schott had told him that we rarely or if ever testify on behalf of a defendant. And and that's not really what we do, Eric. You know, what I mean, this is from but this this is how far this thing goes. Uh, there's a photo of the trial, which I wanted to. See. Yeah, there he is. OK, this becomes like the Lindbergh case. People on the balconies, the, the place stuffed to the gills, people in the windows, people outside, everybody's in there. And that's Malcolm Wallace in the in the court. And he is completely confident that he is going to be vindicated. He looks chill. But yeah, yeah. No, no, that's a great, I, that's a rare photo. That's a very rare photo. He looks completely chill. There's a jury. Um, the prosecution puts out everything, but they can't. Look at the good old boys behind him. Yeah, the good old boys. Those are just local uh, college. Yeah, I know. It's funny. Yeah, yeah, just... Those are college kids from UT because all of the – he holds a press conference, Malcolm Wallace, before the trial at the University of Texas, before thousands of students saying, I need your support. We have to win this case. Dude, I mean, this thing is crazy. Gets on the front page of the newspaper. He he says, I didn't do this. this is, they're trying to frame me. And, okay, it's like a quadrangle. Okay, you've got the Malcolm Wallace, you've got Kinzer, and you've got two women. And all of them are having sex with each other. But that's not the defense. It's not the typical, I caught you with my wife, I can kill you defense. That never comes up. The prosecution does not want to, if you follow my reasoning here, the prosecution does not want to give him a reason for killing Kinzer. That would have been a reason. They can find no motive in this case. No motive is ever brought in this case because the the jealous husband thing doesn't hold, Eric, because he's divorced her three times or there had been a divorce proceeding three times and he don't, couldn't give a shit about her. And he broke up with Josepha Johnson two years prior. Uh, Kinzer was with Josepha Johnson because he wanted her brother, LBJ, to get him one of those business loans. That's what mm -hmm. uh, Kinzer actually asks her. Uh, and she says, he doesn't listen to me anyway. But she's a drunk and she's spouting all over town all of these different LBJ secrets. And she is becoming a liability. She's been in and out of alcoholic wards. When Bobby Baker, if you could show that Bobby Baker uh, cover, we're going to get, we're jumping around a little bit here, but it's all at the same time. This Bobby Baker cover from Life Magazine, Bobby Baker who is the secretary of the Senate called Little LBJ. There he is with his Little LBJ. That's Bobby Baker, his main man, who is his bag man in the Senate. Uh, you had to go to Bobby Baker with the money to get to LBJ. That's why Don Reynolds uh, was involved in testifying the day of the assassination today, 59 years ago today, in the House. He was testifying, uh, not testifying, but he was giving information to House, to Senate investigators about the corruption of LBJ. Now, this is the Bobby Baker bombshell. This was going to be three issues of Life magazine consecutive to take LBJ to prison. This was the first one. There were three more. Unfortunately, Life magazine had to cover another subject, which was the assassination of the president, thereby taking LBJ off of the hot seat, making him the most powerful man in the world. But the Bobby Baker bombshell that they reveal in that issue of Life magazine was that he ran 
money to LBJ, but he also ran a strip of motels outside of D.C., a motel strip. And in there were high class call girls as Bobby Baker and those high class call girls, congressmen and senators would show up and have sex with these high class call girls in these motel units, drinking, partying and then go back to D.C. That was run by Bobby Baker. That was the dirt they had on all the different people that LBJ could control because those women were prostitutes, high class prostitutes. Turns out that one of the high class prostitutes was Josepha Johnson herself. Let that sink in. <laughs> Thanks for coming by. So to continue on, Josepha Johnson is one of the high class hookers. She does this in, in Austin, too, by the way. She's becoming a liability for LBJ. And some people believe, and I assume Rob Morrow and myself, that the motivation for killing Kinzer was that Kinzer knew a lot of stuff from Josepha Johnson about the LBJ crimes. And that's why Kinzer had to be eliminated. This is, one, this is a, a, one theory of the murder of Kinzer, that it was not an act of, of, of jealousy. Like and maybe Kinzer uh, made a phone call to LBJ and said, yeah, you're going to give me one of those loans, aren't you? Well, I don't know if he made a phone call, but she shot her mouth off and pillow talked with Kinzer for months and months and months. And I believe, and I think Rob Morrow probably does too, and some other experts, I don't know if we should have asked Phil Nelson, but I'm sure he probably thinks so too, because the, the prosecution presents no motivation in this case, but regardless of the motivation, the jury finds him guilty of murder one. They find him guilty and across the street or down the street in the hotel is LBJ. And they're running notes to LBJ, comes out to Texas because this case is so important to Johnson. And why would this be in, so important to Johnson if it was just a random act of jealousy of a guy killing a guy over some women? Because there's more to it than meets the eye, Eric. You're but, also uh, bearing a little. It was not just murder one. It was capital yeah. murder one. I think I think the word depraved came in. Depraved indifference was in there. The, they yeah, were, yeah, it, it was, was plugging in the blown. electric chair. And uh, they were getting the electric chair ready for this guy. So uh, Johnson had gotten him a lawyer. And that was COFA, uh, C-O-F-E-R. COFA was the top attorney in the state of Texas, the biggest law firm in the state of Texas is defending Malcolm Wallace. But there's nowhere to really go with this case because it's a slam dunk case. There's nothing you can do. I mean, it's unbelievable amounts of evidence. And the jury takes like 30 seconds, comes back <laughs> with the verdict. So they in that Texas, in these types of cases, the jury decides the penalty, Eric. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the penalty phase comes back later. The first was murder one, we're unanimous. Apparently, according to Rob, 11 of the jurors were for murder one. One was a brief holdout for life in prison, and then they flipped her. You know what I mean? There was one who was a, a yeah. plant. She was a plant in the jury, according to Rob Morrow. Uh, so th that was interesting. Was somehow even she couldn't hold up, you know what I mean, under the duress of the other 11. It was just crazy. So they tried everything. So LBJ has a runner going back and forth with notes on what's going on. And the case goes on for a long time. And they presented all kinds of evidence. And the jury goes out, comes back, and they find him guilty as charged. So the sentence comes back. And you go, wow, well, could be life. Murder one. It's Texas, dude. Yeah. It's Texas. Texas. You talk about 1952, Texas, murder one. Uh, killing a guy, shooting him in the crotch, unloading six bullets into him, fleeing, fleeing the scene, hiding out, getting rid of the weapon, paraffin tests, and everything that you could possibly have in a murder case. The prosecution, prosecution is pretty uh, cocksure what's going to happen. So the jury comes back the next day with the uh, penalty phase, and they come up with a rational penalty phase, five years probation, no time in jail. And here's the scene right here where they're told that he's going to get five years probation, no jail time whatsoever, Eric. Yep, so uh, five years suspended sentence. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> As I just, want that to, just let that sink in at home, what I just told you about Malcolm Wallace and this murder. 
And this is how far LBJ with Ed Clark, who ran Austin, who was LBJ's lawyer, uh, was able to control this murder case in Austin that was an open and shut case to show you the power, the sheer power of LBJ. He's not president. He's just a senator. But this is the power of his gang in that region of Texas and the rest of Texas. That's why Malcolm Wallace looks so calm here in this photo. Now, yes, Malcolm according, Wallace, to Rob, uh, according to Rob Morrow, he, he he broke out to a nice little grin. Oh, yeah, he had the little grin. Yeah, the tiny little Kinda grin. Kind of similar to this one. Yeah, a kind of interesting little grin. So he <laughs> walks out. he walks out a free man. He walks out of this courtroom a free man. And what does he do? He goes back to work for LBJ, who now owns him lock, stock, and two smoking barrels. And he goes back and he, he begins to work in 1954. He begins to work indirectly for LBJ, but he's working on his own with a regular job for a company called Temco, T-E-M-Co, which later becomes Ling Electronics. And this is what we were talking about. This is from 1954. Uh, he gets a, a secret security clearance to work for Ling Electronics. Uh, which is doing government contracting, defense contracting, which is what he goes into now. And he works in the defense industry um, for a number. Which, by the way, a convicted murderer. Yeah, yeah. With yeah, a yeah. secret, a convicted murderer. So no matter what the sentence is, he's a convicted murderer. Right. And I've had a secret clearance. Right. Kind of unusual for somebody to be a convicted murderer who's not legally authorized to even vote. Right. To get a secret clearance with secrets of our country. Right. So uh, he, he he doesn't put him back in the in the agriculture department. He's put in the defense industry. And the reason he's in there is to allow the defense industry to pass money to LBJ. That's why Malcolm Wallace is in there. And he works for uh, Ling, which was Temco, uh, 1954 into 1961 uh, doing this kind of work. And he begins to get involved with some other guys. The guy who, who is his uh, uh, godfather is a guy uh, named D.H. Bird. And uh, D.H. Bird is the, will be in two years, in 1963, the owner, proud owner of a new building. D.H. Bird is a multimillionaire oil guy uh, who also started the Civilian Air Patrol when he made his own custom-made uniform and two junior members of the Civilian Air Patrol were David Ferry and Lee Harvey Oswald. This is run by D.H. Bird, who is the mentor and godfather to uh, the go-between between LBJ and Mac Wallace is D.H. Bird. So D.H. Bird buys this building, and there he is. That, that's in his uniform of the Civilian Air Patrol, another one of these ad hoc military organizations having no real connection to our military. There's a bunch of these running around Texas. Uh, yeah, that's probably at a football game or something because he they would he would go to the University of, of Texas football games where the entire band would play The Eyes of Texas Are Upon You for him at the beginning of the game with everybody standing up singing The Eyes of Texas Are Upon You for D.H. Berg. Not a minor figure in Texas history and best friends with a guy named Lyndon Baines Johnson. Episode on him coming up too, right? I don't know, but the point of the matter is he buys this building, the Texas School Book Depository, where I took Eric on a field trip the other day on our student field trip to go through the building to show him the highlights of the building. And I pointed out that the actual window that the sniper did not shoot through, if you listen to Orville Nix, the window was removed after the assassination and taken to the home as a souvenir of D.H. Bird, where... <laughs> <laughs> where it was, he showed it to guests who would come over for dinner saying that's the window that Lee Harvey Oswald uh, killed the president out of. A, a weird, a weird uh, souvenir, to, to say the least. You also show me the elevator that was installed that year. Yeah, the elevator was installed, a freight elevator to go up and down. And the freight elevator is all part of the uh, folklore of going up and down and all this stuff. Well, you know, the reality of the case is just to go off on a side note was that Bonnie Ray Williams, which you have learned a lot more than you did before. Bonnie Ray Williams, the black guy ate lunch on the boxes that later were assembled into the sniper's nest by the Dallas police department. Bonnie Ray Williams was eating his lunch in that sixth floor window, a chicken sandwich with bones on white bread with a dot, with a Dr. Pepper, with a straw, with menthol cigarettes that he left behind. And in fact, 
Walter Cronkite that night on TV said the sniper ate lunch while he waited for the president. And that story had to go away. And oh, Walter, come on now, Mark. You got to yeah. do the impersonation. People love it when you do Cronkite's impersonations. That's the way it is. Tonight, December 22nd, 19, November 22nd, 1963, the sniper ate a chicken sandwich while waiting for the president to come to the site of Dealey Plaza. Um, anyway, so so Walter Cronkite said that the night of the assassination. And what happened was the Warren Commission had a big problem because Bonnie Ray Williams was up there eating lunch. And where was Oswald? Second floor lunchroom. Why do we know that? Because the, the motorcycle cop and truly, when they came into the building, found Lee Harvey Oswald in the second floor buying a Coca-Cola out of the machine very calmly. And on the sixth floor was the remnants of the lunch by Bonnie Ray Williams. So they made Bonnie Ray Williams go to the fifth floor with his other black friends, one of them named Givens, by the way. And Givens, um, I believe that's Bonnie Ray Williams yep. there. Okay. One of the other black guys was named Givens, and he was also missing from the building. This misnomer that Oswald was the only one missing from the building is a crock of shit because Givens was missing from the building. Why was Givens missing from the building? He was on the fifth floor window looking up at Bonnie Ray Williams, telling him to come down, and Bonnie Ray Williams was looking out the window talking to Givens and the other two guys. But the reason Givens was missing was because he had a, parole, he had a, a criminal record as a junkie. He was, a, he was a heroin addict and he had been busted and done jail time. And they had a roundup Givens and they flipped Givens to do their bidding based on his uh, uh, criminal record as a junkie. So he was able to be told what to say. Bonnie Ray Williams, not so easy. He, he talked to the Warren Commission for hours about his chicken sandwich. And, and they wanted to know, if you, you can read the transcripts, folks, of the Warren Commission interview with Bonnie Ray Williams. It's insane. The commissioners are asking him how you can eat a chicken sandwich with bones in it. This is this is the the interview with Bonnie Ray Williams, and he says you just take the bones out. And indeed, on the floor of the sniper's nest were the bones. So the Dallas police had to clean that up, get rid of the chicken, get rid of the Dr Pepper. And you see a picture. I think it's Lieutenant Day or one of the Dallas cops coming out with the a stick in the bottle of Dr Pepper. Uh, supposedly to check the fingerprints. Of course, the fingerprints on there are Bonnie Ray Williams. Um, so the Warren Commission tries to push back the time to give Oswald time to run up, assemble his rifle, get a position, and shoot the president in, in the head um, uh, within six seconds, you know, multiple shots. So that time is so insanely short that they kept pressuring Bonnie Ray Williams. Did you go downstairs at 1219? Come on, Bonnie. You know you went down. And he goes, no, no, it was more like 1225. It was almost 1230. And they kept chipping away at him to, to get Oswald more time, Eric, in that sniper's nest, which was not a sniper's nest, but just a guy sitting on a box using another box as a table. Now, how do we know that? Because we've now, as we talked to some of the experts in Dallas this week, and myself, who also has the photos, there's multiple photos of different configurations of the sniper's nest because the Dallas police were trying to configure the boxes into a sniper's nest. So they, dude, I mean, it's this is not an unsolvable crime. Nothing indicates frame up more than trying to build a sniper's nest yourself with various configurations and photographing it, which is what they did. You know what I mean? So... Uh, Anyway, Eric saw the sniper's nest, and you realize quickly how crazy of an angle this thing is, Eric, right, with the steam pipe there and everything else? Well, not only that, the uh, picture of the sniper's nest doesn't match the recreated sniper's nest that's sitting there. Which is right next to it. Yeah, there's a picture. Ne yes, you just... <laughs> right next to it. Yeah, it's kind of crazy because I, I think they battled with that thing, and they <clears throat> they know the other photos are out there, but nobody really gets to see those. They're pretty rare. I think we posted them on Locals about six months ago. I put them up there somewhere. Um, I think they're up there. The multiple photos, rather, of the two different configurations. But anyway, so Malcolm Wallace is now working in 1961 uh, for defense contractors, uh, sh kind of funneling money to, to uh, LBJ in Washington through these cutouts, including Billy Saul Estes, and, and you have the murder of Henry Marshall, and you've got this guy, 
chasing after this murder for years. And that's Texas Ranger Clint Peoples, straight shooter who becomes a U.S. Marshal. And he, when when Billy Saul Estes comes out of prison, he is all, and he knows uh, Billy Saul Estes. And he says, I want to know one thing, Billy, and who killed Henry Marshall? And Billy Saul Estes says that Lyndon Johnson was linked to that murder and seven others, including, this is in front of a grand jury, Eric, and a sworn testimony by Billy Saul Estes. Um, when he got out of prison, Billy Saul Estes goes before the grand jury and lists eight murders that LBJ ordered. And the eighth one on the list is John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the president of the United States. That's an official document before the grand jury. And the grand jury um, said, all these people are dead. We can't really do anything about it. But they did say the ruling of the grand jury was that Henry Marshall did not commit suicide, that he was murdered, and it's an open homicide. So that was one thing that came out of the Billy Saul Estes grand jury. And Clint Peoples uh, pursued this uh, uh, until his death. Now, Malcolm Wallace... They're getting back to Malcolm Wallace, because today is November 22nd, 1963. They find uh, some fingerprints on these boxes, and it's the only fingerprints that the Dallas police cannot identify. On and which box. boxes are those, Mark? From the sniper's nest. Oh. So these boxes have fingerprints on them that can't be identified. So one of the investigators, I think it was Howard Weisberg, I'm, I'm not sure, one of the original gangsters, gets the fingerprints of Malcolm Wallace from the Dallas police or the Navy. I'm not really sure which thing. There's a number of sets of Malcolm Wallace's fingerprints because he had to be printed all the time. Uh, Weisberg gets one of the sets and he brings in a guy named Jay Harrison. Jay Harrison was the leading fingerprint expert in the state of Texas or Oklahoma or multiple states for 30 years, uh, the top guy, and they bring in another guy. And they don't tell either guy who these fingerprints are, but both of them come back and they say, these are a match of whatever the ones you gave us are. The fingerprints on the box matches the fingerprints of this guy. They don't know who the guy is. And the guy goes, okay, really? It's Malcolm Wallace. The fingerprints of Malcolm Wallace are confirmed by two top forensic fingerprint experts to be on those boxes up in the Texas School Book Depository. And this is very difficult to get around for any researcher. Now, Joan Mellon has just written a book that we were discussing. Where with she, uh, Phil Nelson. We were discussing with Phil Nelson. The book, uh, in the book, she somehow is hooked up with an FBI agent who volunteers to help her with her book and says that these are not Malcolm Wallace's fingerprints. I don't know who they are, but they're clearly not Malcolm Wallace's. So the book uh, debunks these fingerprint analysis by these two guys, and then she throws the two guys under the bus saying they were no longer certified because they'd retired. It was just some, some, some paperwork shuffle that she did in the book. And it turns out that their sources, and I won't say who the sources are, who have informed us that the book was paid for by the Lyndon Johnson Foundation out of Austin, Texas. So that's why these stories don't go away, folks. That's why these things never get cleared up. There is institutional reasoning now. And, and Eric and I went to the Texas School Book Museum, which is completely institutionalized now and is flipping to a lone nut scenario. Uh, if you look at the books that are for sale, there's no conspiracy books. They are the books of Case Closed by Gerald Posner and other books that indicate that this is Lee Harvey Oswald from the Sniper's Nest. And this evolved over time. This evolved over time to where the museum is now the official uh, uh, lone nut museum that people who are researchers discredit, and rightfully so. You know, so when a guy like like Frazier, who has a book out, Buell Wesley Frazier, his book is prominently displayed now because he's been taken under the wing of the lone nutters. You know, so this guy is now embraced by the crew of, of Gus Russo and and some of these other cats uh, who are Operation Mockingbird or CIA media asset adjacent uh, writers. Uh, Patricia McMillan, who famously is cornered by Max Good in the unbelievably cornered. Well cornered. And he's not even a journalist. I mean, you got to give him credit for just, he's a film editor, for Christ's sake, how he was able to corner McMillan and also Ruth Payne. 
you know, uh, in that movie. So the, what I'm trying to show you is the institutions live on longer than the person. Now, Mal Malcolm Wallace all of a sudden is killed in a single car crash into a, 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 a you know, concrete abutment, and he's dead, Malcolm Wallace. Now, here's the weird... Which happens a lot with the... Johnson. Yeah, it happened to Lee Bowers. It happens to a lot of guys. They crash, have these single car collisions where they're dead. You know what I mean? So Malcolm Wallace is dead, and all of a sudden, years later, I think it's in the late 80s or something, uh, Billy Saul Estes dies, and this woman who uh, goes to his funeral looks at a guy in back of him and looks exactly like Malcolm Wallace. He's got the same glasses, but they're sunglasses. He's wearing a coat. And then she hears his voice and it's Malcolm Wallace, according to this woman. This is, this is, you know, 15 years later, she runs in the bathroom, throws up and comes out and Malcolm Wallace, whoever it was, is gone. And uh, just a really, really strange incident that he may have faked his own death is what she said. Right. And uh, by the way, I encourage everyone, if you follow us on Locals, Phil Nelson breaks it down a bit more in the interview with Mark. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Phil and I get into it. Phil Nelson famously uh, wrote uh, LBJ Mastermind of the JFK assassination. It's a huge book, but it's one of the Bibles of the assassination and LBJ's involvement in it. Now, there are other guys. There's another wing of the JFK assassination research community that will not go to LBJ. They stop right there. As I said to Jim DiEugenio the other night, well, if he's involved in the cover-up, isn't he a co-conspirator, and isn't he involved in Murder One? Well, that kind of caught him off guard, didn't it, Eric? Yeah, it, but he doesn't seem to be as dedicated to protecting Johnson as um, as, as, as your mutual friend. Who? <laughs> Mr. Stone. Oh, Oliver, yeah. And also Robert Carroll, though. I mean, all oh, those... Robert Carroll, yeah, definitely. Robert Carroll, who, who has the, the, the multiple books on LBJ goes right up to the precipice. They all go right to the precipice. And if you look at their own personal politics, they all happen to be liberals. Because the, the JFK community the, the, of, of researchers is kind of nonpartisan. Uh, but the liberals, again, are starting to move because they won't leave well enough alone. Like we heard the other night from that lawyer who told us to call the wonderful Joe Biden to release the documents, another progressive lawyer from Brooklyn. Uh, they start to contaminate their own investigation process because their liberal politics bleeds into the research. And unfortunately, it happens with a lot of them. And they go up against uh, the idea of LBJ and they can't. It's a bridge too far, Eric. They, Even though their instinct tells them they're correct. That even Oliver, there's an even interview. Oliver, with, yes, yes. There's an interview with him where he pretty much cornered himself. Um, uh, uh, Patrick Bet David podcast. David. Yeah, uh, I do have to recommend it because yep. it was one of the best interviews I've ever seen in terms of of him being looked. It wasn't Patrick who did it; it was one of Patrick's partners. But right. he he was just start asking questions, and Oliver's like, "Well, one person would," be, and he said. I kind of just suggested that he is behind it. Yeah. <laughs> he admitted that. <laughs> you can't get out of it. If you if you follow the train, all the roads in the state, all the trains in the station lead to LBJ. Now, is he alone doing this? Of course not. There's multiple no. agencies involved. No. But to say that he's merely covering it up for the good of the country is preposterous. I mean, think about it. He's on the phone, as is Cliff Carter, as is Busby, as are the henchmen to the sheriff's department, to Dallas police, to Charles Crenshaw and Parkland, the surgeons, all weekend long, they're calling up Dallas police and, and saying, you've got your man. They call up Henry Wade, the DA. Every, these are all his officials and LBJ himself, who calls up Charles, gets Charles Crenshaw on the phone, the one of the surgeons in Parkland when Oswald uh, is gut shot. Uh, saying he's got a guy there to take a, a potential deathbed confession if Oswald does speak so they can bury it, obviously, you know. But the fact of the matter is that, that the president of the United States is calling these people up two days after this assassination, telling them to stop investigating it. That's a little bit more than, a, a, you know, 
uh, uh, good of the country investigation uh, 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 cover up. I think this you're a co-conspirator, Eric. Mm -hmm. Well, my, legally you are, aren't you? Or yes, and we covered this, so definitely check out our LBJ episodes because we went into oh, a okay. lot, I a, a, all of these. I, I, I thought we did. Yeah, I thought. Yeah, we did. yeah. De it's definitely worth checking out. I promise. Well, again, the, the point is that for years I thought the Malcolm Wallace uh, uh, murder of Kinzer was a jealousy thing, and that LBJ wanted to get a guy under his wings, and that's why he did it. But there may be. Uh, another motivation would be to silence Kinzer and to silence his own sister, sadly enough, who dies mysteriously of something in her own bed. I'm not really sure what she died of, but uh, she is repeatedly put into on ice in mental institutions and alcoholic wards when she starts to chirp. Uh, but she married this other guy. I think she had two husbands, maybe three, uh, died in her sleep of a cerebral hemorrhage. Uh, there are some... Uh, scuttlebutt that that is not true. Yeah, that is not, uh, I don't know, but I'm just saying there's some discussion in Texas and maybe we can ask Rob Morrow who, or, or Philip Nelson, who probably know what happened to that cerebral hemorrhage. You know what I mean? You know, yep. the, the cerebral hemorrhage is, uh, is real, but who knows what happened in that case. But the fact of the matter is, uh, Josepha Johnson was talking too much and she had to be silenced. I mean, Bobby Baker, uh, Henry Marshall, Cliff Carter, Malcolm Wallace, Horace Busby, Ed Clark, uh, all of these people were all part of this inner circle of LBJ, and they were all dependent upon him financially their entire lives. Once you signed up, it was like the mafia. You couldn't say, I'm done. I mean, you know, uh, 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 Goodwin, who was the speechwriter, Doris Kearns Goodwin's uh, husband, uh, who said, uh, who compared notes with uh what's his name from um uh pbs the other press secretary moyer with bill moyers they they went out and they found two separate psychiatrists and they went to him and said tell us your diagnosis of this man and they described lbj and and uh, uh he came back goodwin and moyers came back they compared notes and they looked at each other completely white in the face saying you know, this is insane. Both psychiatrists said this guy's a megalomaniac, sex addict, alcoholic, bipolar, um, but just describing LBJ. In, in, and there's books about this, The Tragedy of Lyndon Baines Johnson, written by psychiatrists. This is not just rumor and innuendo. Anyway, make a long story short, Goodwin says, I'm out of here. I have a professorship at Antioch or something. I'm just going to resign now, Miss President. It's great working with you. And LBJ goes, ah, hell you are, boy. And he goes, what? He goes, you're going to Vietnam. He goes, what? He goes, you're going to be in the bush by Tuesday. He goes, what the hell are you talking about, sir? He goes, yeah, I drafted you. You might as well get yourself a new pair of boots because you're going to Da Nang. And he turns white. Goodwin turns white and he realizes that he's trapped like a rat. And he goes, OK, Mr. President, I guess I'll stay. And the next day, he says, I guess I'll stay on and serve at your discretion. He goes, you bet your ass you will, boy. And he <laughs> was about to be shipped to Vietnam by LBJ. This is from his own memoirs, from Goodwin's memoirs. So his wife, his future wife, Doris Kearns Goodwin, will famously sleep with LBJ to get her book done. I think it's called American something of a tragedy or something, uh, a biography of LBJ. And um, he had the same M.O. Move over, honey. This is your president. <laughs> and he would pull the sheets back and say, move over, honey. This is your president coming into bed with you. And that was his move. And he, he apparently did that with Doris Kearns Goodwin. Although she denies that. But she told my roommate, Legs McNeil, that she slept with him. Ah. And, and you met somebody else who implied that she who? slept with him. Who? Your friend Roz. Oh, right. No, no. That was Roz sleeping with him, though. No, no, no. no I know. I, it, it wasn't I'm uncommon. A... Yeah. Right. No, no. That was, well, that was the bathing suit move. He he had the bathing suit move where he'd buy them a bathing suit and then they had to try it on in front of him. <laughs> and, and it may not have been a swimming pool around, but that was irrelevant. Um, they had to put it on. And that was another move he did. So that was a 1960 Democratic convention here in Los Angeles where Roz Wyman was his chaperone. Wow. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> well, the good news is there's still a lot of meat on the bone of this story. There's so much more to come. It's so great to go down to Texas to go to the site of these um, nefarious activities, Eric. 
Yeah, it is. Because there's people who know the truth, but they're muted. I mean, they can't get their voice out. There's plenty of, I mean, Madeline Brown, we'll maybe do an episode on Madeline Brown, who was at Clint Murchison's house that night when LBJ said uh, famously, after tonight, the Kennedys won't have, won't be able to kick me around any longer. Um, so, there, you know, and also just his relationship with RFK, how he said repeatedly, I'm going to slit his throat if it's the last thing I do. I mean, you can't just make, I mean, normal people don't make these political statements. I mean, normal politicians, I mean, I'm sure Bernie Sanders doesn't walk around saying I'm going to slit Donald Trump's throat if it's the last thing I do, you know. Well, maybe. Probably you know, not. Probably not. But, uh, yeah, so, yeah, the Malcolm Wallace story is a really, really deep story in terms of his activity, and and, and I thought it was a, a lot less, but apparently not. You know, uh, Malcolm Wallace... Uh, obviously a murderer, Eric, obviously, like you pointed out, a convicted murderer, but he may have done, they imply that it, he did Henry Marshall too. Um, that's, that was the first murder, um, but there may have been others. He may have done all eight. And with the fingerprints, number eight was JFK on the list uh, for the grand jury. Insane. Insane. Yeah. The fingerprints can't be explained. And no matter, I can't get out of the fingerprint storyline. He, even if you just say he was up there working for D.H. Bird, moving boxes around or checking out how good the a week in advance just to make sure the assassination was going to go well. You know what I mean? I mean, some people nobody's making Ma Malcolm Wallace the shooter, although I have seen that. Uh, what I believe is that he was up there as a manager, you know, just to make sure that everything was copacetic a day or two before. And the fingerprints don't stay forever. So they were pretty recent. They had to have been within 24 hours, Eric. I don't Definitely. know. How, yeah, I don't know how long fingerprints could last on a box, but it's certainly not forever. Mm, no, oh, it depends on, on the greasiness. I'm sure the Bonnie Race prints are on the box. Yeah, they were on, <laughs> they were on everything. The chicken was on everything and, and the you know the the Dr. Pepper too. Oh, for sure. All right. Well, good news. We have some super chats that came in, including one before it even started. Really? Yep. Justin Moore is giving us a happy Thanksgiving to Thanks, us. Justin, thank you. Thank you. Um, deeply depreciated. Wow, today's already every, met. Yeah. Thank you. They say the shots can. That's yeah. That's that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. And Sparty is a teacher, which is really cool. Did we were sitting next to a history teacher? Remember at the dinner mm -hmm. at the banquet, and he said he quit. He couldn't take it anymore. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mark, uh, yeah, I get off on little things. I get excited about crazy. <laughs> I'm easily amused by weird stuff. I don't know. Uh, Scott Grumpy finally caught you live. Just want to slip you some cash. Keep up the good work. Whoa, part eight. Thank you. Thank party you very party. much. And Todd Larson. Uh, I was up in Big D. Did you all catch the reenactment with four 1963 convertible Lincoln Continentals? No. I no, I didn't even know that was happening. Four of them? What does four of them have to do with it? With I don't know. Maybe to have the different points of time. Oh, oh yeah. Well, I mean, you could look at JFK and the making of JFK. If you look at, if you get the DVD and the Blu-ray, you could see where Oliver is reenacting it and how fanatical they are. And they're in the Texas School Book Depository, you know, for over a month, uh, working on the film. Yeah, you said he uh, rented out a floor, Mad Scientist. Oh, no, thank no. you very much. He, he didn't rent it out. When I say he owned it, I mean they had, had permits. Right, but I'm sure that there were some financial considerations involved. Oh, that I don't know. Uh, I remember an LP called the first. Right, yeah. Yeah, I have that. I have that. Yeah. Okay. Um, happy birthday to you, Joel Singh. Joel Singh. I was born. Wow. Inter oh, it's his birthday. I just got that. Yeah. Oh, happy birthday. Wow. Happy birthday. And we're your favorite channel. That's awesome. Thank you very oh, much. Barrel action. And then Willard White, like Radar O'Reilly, making a cheap, mailing a cheap. Uh, kind of, yeah. I mean, the Willard White story became, it was a huge story. I, I didn't realize, he, I, for me, I didn't realize, I knew the Willard White story for years. I didn't realize he was married to Josepha Johnson until recently. Hmm. Somebody's asking, do you, have you heard of Jim Fetzer's work on JFK? I yes, I have. Okay. Um, oh, I already played that. Uh, Chris Walney, thank you very much. Another great show. Thank you. Hi, and Chris. thank you, Chris. And uh, super sticker from Eli McKinnis. McKinnis. Thank you, sir. 
anyway, um, uh, on that note, this is amazing. We have so much stuff that's going to be coming out, you know, over the next weeks because I'm not going to just go edit and drop it the same day. Mm. Um, but all exclusive, talking to some real luminaries on locals. On locals, I thought uh, I did pretty good for uh, an amateur. You're not an amateur. <laughs> no, but it's funny because, like, you, you know, they don't know when they're being interviewed because they're used to getting somebody who may know something. But we were having in-depth discussions about really minor things in these assassinations. So it was a lot of fun. But, yeah, I mean, some of these you're going to watch probably multiple times yeah, because yeah. they got they got in the weeds and did not bother defining anything. We had people Georgina, watching us. Thank Georgina, you, Dana. Thank you. My birthday. Okay, happy birthday. Yeah, we had people watching us do the interviews. That became a separate sideshow. Yeah, that's true. We had people watching the interview. We were doing them in the lobby in different places, but mm, yeah, um, in that other um, conference. I was surprised how many people who were attending these uh, uh, conferences knew about us. They came up to me privately uh, during the conference, you know, saying that they watched the show. I was, I was very pleased. And flattered. Yeah, it was very flattering. So, and again, we. Um thank all of you for your support to help get the word out there to where they can recognize the show. Yeah. Cause it's, it's amazing to consider that people actually know who the hell we are, <laughs> what the show is about. It's a little as, weird. It's as, a little weird. As, I mean, as much as we complain uh, about people uh, forgetting to uh, do this. Oh, thank you, Eric. That was good. You <laughs> the bottom, right. And, and if you want to PayPal me or Venmo me for more JFK books, because there are books out there that I want to get at least to even discredit the books, Eric. You know what I mean? Sure. So the pay, JFK PayPal Venmo book fund is alive. If you want to uh, uh, make a tax deductible donation of that, that's going to go to JFK books for sure. Don't think it's tax deductible, but we'll appreciate say, it. No, no, I say everything is tax deductible because I don't want the money going to the Biden administration. So I use tax deductible <laughs> with quotation marks. Okay. It's not, and, it's not official. Obviously, it's not official tax deductible. But uh, let's, not, uh, let's not feed this freaking beast any more than we can, all right? I mean, delay. I'm delaying paying anything till he gets out. So I'll take the penalties and wait it out because I don't want to give this mutt any more of my fucking money that he could send to Ukraine, have it come back laundered with this curly-headed nitwit that from FTX or whatever that thing is with that buck to his girlfriend. I mean, this is the craziest scandal I've ever heard in my life, Eric. Right. On that note. Um, and, and Mark got to see Oswald in person. Oh, yeah. He brought Oswald with him. That was kind of yep. nice. You know, I got uh, on the plane last night and in, uh, there's a couple sitting there and they've got their giant golden retriever under the seat a full-size golden retriever and i said how's it going he's going whoa, whoa, whoa. i said how is this even possible you're bringing that dog on they had a golden retriever on the on the plane Not no on the way back we had somebody who had a uh, chucky support doll oh that was weird that was weird thank you uh paul thank you thank you very much yeah well, don't georgina I'm ah. back again well she couldn't take it anymore I have my older brother watching the Kennedy shows. He doesn't believe it. Ha ha. Wait till he's done, Georgina. He'll be calling you up. <laughs> <the door. laughs> Comparing notes. Yeah, yeah. That's what happens is if people watch, not just watching this, but you start to get in and and it's kind of like the left telling you never to watch Fox News. So you start watching Fox News and you go, holy shit, how did I miss all this crap my whole life? You know, which is what happened to me. And that's why they tell you not to look at these conspiracy books. And that's why they, they put out the case closed by Gerald Posner and books that you should read. And then you become Ben Shapiro, where you read this one book and you go, they're not going to see here. There's nothing at all. What are you talking about? But I mean, once you start getting into the thing, it is so obvious. It's, it's bizarrely so many smoking guns and Achilles heels. It's not one smoking gun. It's hundreds of smoking guns as we pointed out in the series, that indicate uh, uh, what the truth is in this matter. So, I mean, I could dismantle anybody in five seconds because there's so, I mean, when you, when you, when I was talking to Jim about different things and we said, where does the bullet go that's in his throat? Where does that shot come from? Outer space? It comes from the front. Okay. Wh where's the shooter? There's only one place it could come from. And nobody talks about this. Even not Cyril Wecht. Is, yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He's sketchy on it too, which right, is very right, funny. Right. 
Where's the shot in the back? It goes in a half an inch. Where's that bullet? Well, I don't know. It only it doesn't traverse. I mean, the yeah. shot to the throat and the shot to the back. They go. Well, and then you asked him about Connolly. He didn't really think about Connolly at all. Never knew about Connolly at all. The sh- how does Con- yeah. if Connolly if the magic bullet is bullshit, which it is, which it, which it is. The whole story is crazy. It's made up by all inspector by his own admission, so they can you know work backwards and frame the three bullets. Okay, well, who shoots Connolly then? If, if, if the magic bullet is made up, and and it is. Who and what and where is John Connolly shot from? And nobody has thought about this. Even Jim, you see this this blank look on people's faces. There's aspects of this case that still have not been resolved. The Yiddish word, mishpruka, mishpruka. Eric is part of one of my friends, so he's part of the mishpruka now. That's the word of the day. (laughs) So (laughs) just just briefly getting back to Kennedy, uh, to Connolly, he shot almost in a direct line straight down where it's five inches below his right shoulder, comes out 13 inches below in his chest and then goes into his leg uh, almost straight down. And when you start to ask, where did that come from? People get very confused because it doesn't match any of the normal uh, theories of the shooting. If you follow what I'm saying, Eric, mm-hmm. and I believe it came from the roof. Uh, almost straight down the Texas School Book Depository rooftop, uh, straight down into Connolly. I don't think they were shooting at Connolly, but it's a moving vehicle and blah, blah, blah. And Eric and I saw where the curb shot happened right below on the train on the trestle, the overpass. So I think that came from the roof too, because the angles of these shots don't make sense. If you're, forget about the sixth floor, you also have the second floor of the Dal Tex building. And don't forget weathers for the sheriff is up on top of the county courthouse with a sniper's rifle, too. So there's different shooters that we know, but there may be shooters that were never revealed. I mean, we know, you know, obviously the picket fence is just such a clear shot of, you know, so close where people saw a badge man and puffs of smoke and people with mud behind the thing and Lee Bauer seeing the trap. That's fairly well established. That's fairly well established that somebody was at the picket fence shooting right there. Uh, not so much on the overpass, Eric, where we were with the throat shot. Nobody yeah, ever talked about that that overpass on the extreme left hand side, which is an inch away from the federal building. Okay, um, Kizzy's asking about Tippett. Uh, Kizzy, we have an episode on Tippett. It's the first one in the series. Definitely check it out. And we have that the new Tippett ex- expert. Yeah, well, that's coming. That'll be on locals. And, it's funny, when I saw him the other day, he was taking Paul Blow uh, on the Tippet Walk on Monday. Okay, uh, it, he was taking him on the the, the supposed uh, Oswald Walk that gets him to Tippet. He was going to walk through Paul Blow. So people were hooking up, doing weird things, you know, f- helping each other with the case. It was kind of interesting how people hooked up together to compare notes and that's the beauty of these conferences and hopefully eric and i will go back uh next year for the 60th which is going to be huge uh we mm-hmm. may have multiple conferences eric you know because depending on who's speaking you know yeah depending. well we, we barely spent any time in the conference yeah, we were we busy spend- chasing people yeah so. yeah because you can't interview them in the conference they got movies going so you got to like catch them when they come out and then um, put the bite on them all right well on that note friday We'll be doing some form of an informal episode. We haven't decided what's going to break down, a Feedback Friday, a Q&A, but it, it'll be some sort of episode along that line. Really? And yes. <laughs> that's what we agreed on. <laughs> oh, oh, that's, oh, right. Okay. Well, and Barnes is the week after, right? Because I think they said- Yeah, Barnes is the first uh, week. So I believe that's so. The following Friday, I think, Eric. We'll have Barnes and uh, who knows who Exactly. Comes. Well, that's a freeform Friday. So the first Friday of every month is a freeform Friday. Mm-hmm. The other Fridays will be some sort of a casual Friday, freeform, feedback, Q&A. We, we haven't decided how to break it down, but Tuesdays in general will be the meat episodes. Meat. Uh, another possibility is if there is a Baldwin break, that could be on a Friday or Tuesday, depending you know, we do pay attention to that, and they do little trickle dumps, like they did a little dump on Baldwin last week that we talked about um, when we were on the road. 
So right. we never know what's going to happen. But in general, Fridays are, are going to be more fun, less formal, answering questions, getting feedback, and just trying to interact with all of you more. And then Tuesdays are more the prep type of episodes. So, okay. I just want to read one final paragraph from uh, okay. Murder Most Foul. Okay. Because it's so good. Okay. Hush, little children. You'll soon understand the Beatles are coming. They're going to hold your hand. Slide down the banister. Go get your coat. Ferry across the Mersey and go for the throat. There's three bums coming all dressed in rags. Pick up the pieces and lower the flags. I'm going to Woodstock. It's the Aquarian age. Then I'll go over to Altamont and sit near the stage. Put your head out the window. Let the good times roll. There's a party going on behind the grassy knoll. Stack up the bricks and pour the cement. Don't say Dallas don't love you, Mr. President. Put your foot in the tank and step on the gas. Try to make it to the triple underpass. Black face singer, white face, white face clown. Better not show your faces after the sun goes down. I'm in the red light district like a cop on the beat, living in a nightmare on Elm Street. When you're down on deep Elm, put your money in your shoe. Don't ask what your country can do for you. Cash on the barrel head, money to burn. Dealey Plaza, make a left-hand turn. Go down the crossroads, try to flag a ride. That's the place where faith, hope, and charity died. Shoot him up while he runs, boy. Shoot him up while you can. See if you can shoot the invisible man. Goodbye, Charlie. Goodbye, Uncle Sam. Frankly, Miss Scarlet, I don't give a damn. What is the truth and where did it go? Ask Oswald and Ruby. They ought to know. Shut your mouth, says the wise old owl. Business as usual, and it's murder most foul. See you on Friday. Thank you.